Yeah, a lot of people tell me that they're just watching the video. That's good. That's good, actually. Yeah, there's, uh, I, I think I've said this like 10 billion times, but um, the Khan Academy, do you guys know what Khan Academy? Yeah, so his, when he, get, when he gave his TED Talk, he said, um, they basically, when he was getting started, he basically flipped the education system around. So um, lectures were like a homework session, and homework was the lectures. And it said, he it made like, all the difference and it said it was way better because when people went home to watch the videos, they were learning at their own pace. They'd watch the videos at their own pace, they'd pause it, they'd rewind it, whatever, rather than teaching like 30 people with different learning styles, different learning paces at once. And then when they went to class, they would do homework at like discussion and like all this stuff like that. And, and I, I really wanna do that someday because I really do believe in that. But um, yeah, it really does. But uh, until, uh, until I figure out these videos properly. <laughs> um, can someone go to the Hangout and make sure my screen is being shared? I haven't shared it yet. I just started sharing it, so it should take a couple minutes. OK, so um, last week and this week, what we're trying to do is we're trying to really rush through getting the Rails RESTful resource finished, um, because we're pretty close to being done. Uh, and the thing is, we only have about three to four weeks left in the course because of exams and then summer and then pretty much that's it. So uh, I would like to, if possible, get to JavaScript and get to Ajax after this. Um, that Just kind of a light introduction to that so you guys know what Ajax is, you guys know what JavaScript is. Because once you have that in your kind of pocket of Rails development and how the full you know, Web 2.0 works, once you have JavaScript and, and client-side code in, in your pocket, then really it gives you a good foundation to learn whatever you want that's out there. Um, you, uh, like people, uh, really big popular stuff today is uh, uh, client side frameworks um, like Backbone, Marionette, Ember, Angular is another big one. Um, to get to that level, uh, it's nice to have a good grounding in JavaScript and jQuery. Um, but to, to be honest, uh, getting that good grounding uh, doesn't really involve learning it properly because you can like play around with jQuery, you can play around with JavaScript all you want without, without ever learning it properly. Um, and then you would naturally lead into those frameworks, so that's, that's all right. Um, but if, if you do get a chance after this course and you're really interested in client-side stuff, uh, do yourself a favor and try to learn J JavaScript properly. It's one of the, uh, it's one of the many, many languages um, that, that are web-related that people can really get by knowing um, but without ever learning properly. The nice thing about university is that you guys actually do sit down and properly learn stuff. Like Java, for example. You guys probably know the ins and outs of Java like crazy now. Uh, and you're probably still going to continue to learn it up until you graduate, right? And the nice thing is you take a nice structured approach to learning that. You learn objects, you learn classes, you learn keywords, and you learn it in this completely uh, kind of linear, logical way. Versus, could you imagine kind of approaching Java the way you probably approach a lot of web languages, which is, oh, I need to put this button on screen, let's Google Stack Overflow, oh, there's a copy and paste, put that in your code, right? You can get by, you can do it, but it, it, you don't really get this you know, kind of big picture of, of how everything's working. JavaScript, I think, is notorious for that. Uh, I myself did not learn JavaScript properly for a really long time. Even today, after I sat down and decided to learn it properly, I still don't have a, a full, full understanding of it. Uh, it is a very, very weird language if you're coming from traditional uh, object-oriented programming languages like Java, C Sharp, C++, Ruby. Uh, it, it departs heavily from that because JavaScript doesn't have the idea of classes. It has this idea of prototype chaining and stuff like that, which is really confusing. Um, so a lot of that stuff can be lost, actually. Um, so my big recommendation is if you're going to get into any serious web programming, um, you know, do yourself a favor after this course and maybe try to learn some JavaScript uh, properly by yourself. If you want a recommendation of where to go, uh, there's a website called, I think JavaScript is sexy. Yep. Be careful what you type there. Um, and actually, even if you just Google like learn JavaScript properly. Uh, that's the course I took. And basically what it is, it's just this um, post that has all these references, like go buy this book uh, electronically, go read these articles, go do this and that and whatever. And it's, it's crazy what you can learn about JavaScript. And again, it's, it's very eye-opening for somebody who did JavaScript for, I did JavaScript for maybe five or six years before I sat down and learned it. And there was so much new to learn there. 
Are we broadcasting? Sweet. Enough killing time. OK, so where we left off is we were building this RESTful resource, right? It was all about, uh, we've, we've done it over and over again, this routine of web request, server-side processing, and response, OK? Now, what we're framing this around is a RESTful resource. In other words, we're framing this around a object that you can store in memory and you can act on in CRUD actions using RESTful HTTP conventions, so things like when you want to get, or sorry, when you want to read an object, you use the get verb. You use the get HTTP request. If you want to update, you use a, uh, a, a put or a patch. If you want to create, you use a post. These are all conventions that have been established around um, HTTP RESTful uh, web services. So if you ever come across another RESTful API in, in the web, it should behave very similarly. All the routes that we're creating, all the responses that you're creating, uh, they should behave very similarly. And that's what we're building. So um, the thing to remember about all this, though, is that uh, I, I kept mentioning this last week, that this is all um, uh, semantic conventions. In other words, Everything that we do here, there's nothing technologically blocking you from doing another another way. So for example, if you wanted to use a get request to do an update, you could technically do that. There's no, uh, there's no uh, piece of HTTP protocol that blocks that from happening. Okay, So this is all like we've agreed upon in the software community to say, if you're ever using a get, it shouldn't update any any data uh, in, in your uh, database, OK? So things like that is what we're, what we're, what we're driving towards, OK? So last week, um, we had finished the show, and we'd finished the index. Uh, we had also started, no, we'd finished the new, and we were getting to the create. We're kind of halfway through the create at this point. Um, one of the things I was stressing last week, if we bring up the code here, um, one of the things I was stressing last week was, um, where are we here, new, was this really powerful uh, view helper called form four, okay? And actually, sorry, last week was the first time we dealt into view helpers. Okay, they were kind of, uh, what view helpers are, are their Ruby on Rails methods that spit out HTML for you. But they spit it out in usually a very, very smart way. Now, some can be very dumb uh, in the sense that you have a Rails helper that spits out pretty much the exact same amount of code as HTML code. So you might ask yourself, why not just type it as HTML? In that case, probably it makes sense, OK? But in most cases, because whatever HTML we put on here is interacting with our Rails server in the back end, OK, it's easier to do things like this. So in this example, with the form for here, because we use this form for uh, method that spit out a, uh, that we were asked to pass in basically this method here, and this spits out a form builder for us, because we did that, it, it, it named our text fields and text areas all in a way that was easy to deal with on the Rails backend when we submitted this form. Okay? In the, in the sense that when it got to the, when, it, when this form got submitted to the server, um, this news post came in as a hash, and that hash had properties of title and body, and we were able to just pass that into a method called new, and that created our news post for us. Okay, so again, you could have just as easily uh, hard coded your HTML form, uh, not using form helpers, and you could have massaged that data once it got to your server end. But why go through all that hassle when you can save yourself coding just by following the Rails conventions and using the Rails helpers that follow those conventions, OK? Now, if for those of you who are caught up with me in the code, uh, before we get started, I'm just going to start a, a download in the background um, so that way we're not waiting for it when we get to it. So if you guys can go to your gem file, um, so again, Command P and just start typing gem file. Make sure it's not gemfile.lock. That's a different thing, OK? So we go to the gem file. Um, so last week, we added a very handy uh, gem called pry. This allowed us to set uh, breakpoints in our, uh, our web application, so allowed us to do some debugging. Um, I found out today, actually, that Rails 4.2 and maybe even 4.1 ships with another one called bug by, by bug. That is also, I, I'm assuming, is the same thing, because when I look at that gem file, it says set breakpoints. So I'm like, okay. 
So that's that's in there. Um, so it's probably just an alternative to Pry. Okay, but Pry also ships with a, it's like a fancy uh, Rails console as well. Um, so anyways, I use that for, for debugging. Anyways, while we're on that, if you guys can just add the device gem. Okay, so gem device. We're going to be using this for our authentication and authorization. Um, again, this course is kind of too short for us to code our own authentication and authorization. And I like to tell people, again, I like to tell people that uh, as good as it is to learn that, and uh, I, I mean, as, as good as uh, you can get understanding that stuff, uh, to be honest, in practice, uh, I use Devise a lot. A lot of Rails developers use Devise a lot. Um, so it's not exactly the end of the world if you don't learn another uh, authentication system. Okay. All right. So while that is there, if you guys just go to your Rails root of your project, and if you guys just type bundle um, to start installing that gem, uh, that'll be in the later part of today. Okay. So we'll let that go. Let that install. Okay. Any questions about where we are and where where we're going in terms of finishing this Rails resource? Okay. Cool. All right. So let's continue this. Um, so where we left off basically was our news post controller. We had basically left off with a successful news post. Okay. So the way we structured this is we're going to create a brand new news post in memory, passing in uh, our news post params hash. And last week, we talked about this, two strong parameters. OK? The idea of basically adding a security layer before it hits an update uh, call, OK? Or a new call. And so basically, what we did here is once we established this news post in memory, we said, if at newspost.save, then redirect to news posts, else do something else. Okay? And we didn't really get to that point. So here, this at news post.save, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, and we're going to code uh, one of those things going wrong, actually. We're actually going to use that as our effect. Now, I want to repeat this uh, because this is a pretty important lesson. And a lot of people. Uh, I, I've noticed in the web community on Ruby and Rails, when they're getting started, they don't really fully grasp redirect and render and the difference between the two. OK? So I'm going to do this demonstration one more time. Um, so a couple of you guys were here for that big demonstration of the web request uh, that we had. We had like seven people in it. Uh, you, you were part of that, right? Uh, is it Nell? Yes, Nell was part of that. Uh, Ryan was part of that, and a whole bunch of other people we're part of that. And the whole idea, I was trying to demonstrate this idea of web request and response, okay? We whittled it down to a server and a client, right? I'm going to use Ryan again. So Ryan is my browser, okay? And he is constantly sending me requests as the web server, and I'm constantly sending him responses. I may do stuff in the background before I send him response, but that's ultimately how the web works, right? The reason I repeat that over and over again is because really, if you understand that concept, you're going to understand a lot of web, okay? So in this case, what we're doing is Ryan is submitting a form. Okay, So if we start up our Rails server, we have to track how many web requests are happening here and how many web responses are happening here. Okay, So if we load up our web server here, no, that's not. Oh, thanks. There we go. Uh, OK, so here we are. And when we click on new news post, that's the first, well, we, we did a couple requests there. But let's take it from there. This is the first request that Ryan's going to send me. When he clicks on that link, OK, he sends a request to me, goes to the routes, goes to the new action. The new action by default renders the new template. I render that template. In other words, I massage all the data in there. If there's any ERB tags, I fill those in. I put those into a web response and send that back to Ryan. And Ryan's browser renders it like this. Okay, That's what's happening when he uh, clicks on that link. Now, second request. Okay, He's going to fill this out. 
So uh, Jim Watson hip is out. Snowmobiles. Okay, this is real news. So okay, so Ryan is going to submit this form now. One thing I didn't talk about last week, uh, I kind of went up, glossed over this fact, is what we're doing is we are sending a, another web request, but for the first time in, in this entire course, we are sending more than just the URL. Like we're more sending more than just a request to the URL. We're actually sending data along with it. Okay, so this is this is the most simplistic diagram ever, but it, it, it's important to know that one way you can send data along with your request, okay, is by submitting a form. Okay, when you have form tags in an HTML page with a submit button, okay, when you hit submit, that is going to send a request to the web server, and along with it is going to go any of any of the input fields that are within those form tags. Okay, so whether it be text field, text area, check boxes, radio buttons, drop down lists, all those things get sent with their values to the Rails server. Okay, we call that post data. Okay, the reason we call it post data is because uh, we're sending a post request. Okay, by default, when you create a form, you're going to send a post request. It's going to hit the Rails server. Okay, data is coming along with that request. This is going to be become a big factor in AJAX as well when we talk about this. AJAX. Okay. So you're sending a request to a certain URL, and with it comes all this data, OK? Now, Rails is very smart with that, because what it does with all that data that comes over uh, the request is, again, it massages it. It looks at the names of uh, the fields and puts it into a params hash, OK? Puts it into that params hash, and then we use that params hash to create the news post. Okay, so that's the second request. The first request Ryan gave me, I sent him back a form. I sent him back a page with a form in it. He hits submit, a second request comes to me with some data, and I do that server-side processing to create that data, okay? So I assign it to news post, I save it, and as long as the result of that save is successful, then I send him back a response, okay? Now here's where subtle differences between redirect and render happen, okay? First subtle difference uh, is specific to Rails. The redirect method, okay, that we're calling here, that's a method call, okay? The redirect method that we call here, by the way, is uh, a halting uh, method. In other words, when you go through a, uh, when you go through a controller action like this, anything below a redirect is not gonna happen, okay? That's like a return statement, basically, in, in a, in any other language, okay? So redirect is going to return. And what it's going to do, though, the response that it sends back to Ryan, we're used to sending back HTML pages to Ryan, right? We're sending HTML.erb, they get massaged, and we send that back to them. This is the first time we're not actually sending a page back. When you say redirect to, okay, what that's going to do is it's going to create a kind of like a, an instruction piece of mail or an instruction message that gets sent to Ryan. And inside that message has a URL of where he's supposed to go. All right, so redirect to. So when Ryan submits that form and I create the news post, I don't send him back a page. I send him back a redirect response. Ryan gets that redirect response, opens it up, and says, hey, I should be redirected to another page. And then so he sends another request to actually get to that page. OK? The reason this is important is that because it's a brand new separate request, Okay, any, any variables or anything that we set up in here will not be available wherever that ends up, okay? And that happens a lot, where it's like, okay, I created a news post and I put an at sign in there. How come that at news post is not available in this slash news post? It's because I, all I sent back to him was a uh, redirect uh, instruction, and he had to send another request to get to that page, okay? Whereas if something goes wrong, we are gonna use render, and render is not that case. Render is actually uh, rendering an HTML page and sending that back, okay? Which is what we've been doing actually all along, okay? All right, so let's actually do something here. Okay, so at newspost.save, what we're gonna do is again, we're gonna break Rails convention here. Typically, you would render something that is of the same name, right, of, as a controller action. We're gonna break convention, and what we're gonna do very typically is we are going to render 
uh, the new page. Because think about it, if, if you create a new, uh, a new news post and there's an error, pretty good user experience is you're brought back to that page and say, hey, you have some errors, here's the form that you, you filled out, you know, and enter some new stuff to make sure this works out. Okay. Now, um, I, I haven't outlined to you guys how this will ever be false, okay? For now, just to demonstrate how this is going to work, okay? Um, let's just do this uh, for now. Let's comment this out and write uh, if false. Let's see how this is going to run, okay? So we're going to submit a new post. It's going to create a new one in memory. We're not calling the same, so it's not actually saved to the database. It's not going to run this because that's in the false block. It's just going to run to the new. Okay. Now again, this is very similar, or should look very similar to this, right? Because remember, what, what this is doing is effectively this, right? It's just implied in Rails, right? Because it's the same name. So effectively, all we're doing is we're creating a news post in memory. In, in the top case, it happens to be blank with no values. And we render the new template. Here, we're creating a news post in memory. The main difference being here is that um, this one actually has values. When you pass in a hash to the new function, it's actually setting those values, like title and body. OK, so the really only difference between these two is that this one has blank values. This one has actual values, but they're both just in-memory news posts. And they both end up rendering new. OK? So this should look very similar, both ways we do this, OK? So let me show you how this is going to work. OK, so save that. OK, so if we do a get new, that's what it looks like. The form would create a new news post, title body, and create news post button. OK? If I enter something, uh, OK? If I enter something and I create news post, remember what's going to happen. It's going to come to this route, because we're posting to that route. It's going to create a new news post with those values, and then jump down to this render new. So it should appear similar to this, because it's just taking that rent new.html.erb, massaging it, and rendering it out here. So let's see. Create new news post. OK, there we went. OK, so now, it, I mean, it looked like it didn't do anything. But it actually did send a request. It came back, generated the form. Now, the only difference here is it actually filled out values for title and body. All right? And that's because. When we look at new.html.erb, it's all because of the magic of what Form 4 does. Last week, I talked about how Form 4 names your fields properly. Okay, I talked about how Form 4 gets the URL and the verb proper. The other thing that Form 4 does is whatever values are sitting in the object that you set up, that you're passing to it, okay, it's going to use those values as the values for your input fields. Okay. In the new case, those just happen to be blank. They're nil. So that's why they're not filled out. In this case, they're not nil, right? Because whatever you passed in, we created a new news post with those values, and that got passed all the way through to here. OK? So take home there is the new route and the, the failed create route are pretty much the exact same, except one has pre-filled values and the other one doesn't. That's all there is. OK? And that kind of makes sense, because if you fail to create a news post, you represent that form to your user. You put in the same fields that they had as before, right? And then when they submit, it should be as if they just entered those values brand new, right? It should be the same kind of request, right? OK, so that's what we got there. OK, so let's change this back to how it should be. So at newspost.save. And really quickly, without doing a full lecture on it, I'm going to show you one way that the news post save can fail. Okay? And that's with a validation on the model. You can add validations on a model to say every model should have 
uh, a title. Every model should have a body. Every model uh, should have a unique password. Every model should have this or whatever. Okay, you can add those validations. And you can, what that does is that you can create those objects in memory, but if you try to save them and they don't pass the validation, then it, it returns false and it doesn't actually save it to the database. Okay? So if you go to your news post model, we are going to add our first validation. We're going to add our first piece of code in the model. The model has generally been very empty up, up to this point. Okay? Uh, okay. I so rarely do validations that I forget the syntax. Okay, I believe it's validates, which is the method. It takes in the name of a field. So, uh, no, that's not right. Let me see here. It's, it's only along these lines. There we go. I was on the right track. Okay. Uh, again, I don't want to do a full lecture on, on validations. Um, but that's basically one of the validations you can set. Okay. So this basically says when you create a record, validate that the title is present. Okay. Again, the way you can read this is this is a method call. Okay, this is the first argument. And this is the second argument, which is like a hash. Okay. So what this does is when this class is loaded, validates, runs, and adds this bit of code to your model. Okay. Let's see that in action. Let's see, see how that works. Let's bring up the Rails console. So let's create a new news post. And let's try to save it. Okay. When we try to save it, you see the result of that transaction, or sorry, the result of that method call is false. Okay. And it tried to save it, and it just rolled it back because it, it's basically not valid. Okay. Leave. So internally, Rails can use this method called valid, check if it's valid or not. Okay. But look, if we add a title to this. Okay, then news post is valid and we can actually save it. Okay. So with that in play, we should be able to do this now. So oops. So if we go to a new news post and we don't put in a title, we just put in a body. Okay. It spits us back to this page. We haven't coded anything that says, hey, you have an error. Okay. Um, but that would be the next logical step. Okay. We would go in and we'd say, if there are errors, spit out you know, those errors and tell the user if you're missing the title or whatever. Okay. Uh, we might have time for that at the end of this class. Uh, but again, I want to kind of get through this because we're running out of a lot of time. Okay. All right. So that is create done. Any questions on that? Cool. All right, let's do edit and update. OK, so again, uh, just like uh, creation, we split that up into two pieces, presenting the form and then an action to handle submitting a form. Same thing with edit. Edit is you are presenting an edit form, and you are submitting that edit form to perform the update. OK. So. Uh, let's see here. If we go back to our news posts, okay, let's create um, basically our edit route. Okay, so same, same song and dance, the route, the controller, and the response, right? Okay, so edit, again, we're just presenting the view, or sorry, the edit form. So a get request is suitable here. We're not updating anything at this point. And this is what the edit URL looks like. Slash news posts, slash ID, slash edit. OK. That is going to go to the news post controller. And that's going to go to the edits, uh, edit 
action. Okay. So let's create that edit action. Okay, the edit action. What we're going to do here is something very similar to what's happening in the news post create fail attempt. Right? When, when, when the news post failed to create, we had this at news post in memory with the, with the values already set, and we passed them to the form four, and it filled up the form for us, right? Same thing we're going to do with edit, right? If you want to edit something, you typically have those fields already filled out, right? It's like, if you want to edit the title and the body, you should probably present the current title and the current body, right? Nothing's forcing you to, but again, it's pretty, pretty general user experience, right? So in order to do that, let's extract that news post out from the database, OK? So we're going to get that news post out from the database using our find method. OK, find takes in an ID, OK? And remember, the I, anything that's passed in through the URL is passed into the params hash as well. Okay. Again, another way you can read this is that there are brackets around here. Okay. This is why the params hash is actually very powerful, right? It doesn't require you to separate query string parameters from post parameters from uh, URL uh, variables. All this stuff gets thrown into the params hash. Okay? A lot of other languages, you actually have to say, get the request data, or get the post data, or examine the URL and parse it and find that stuff. Okay? This all gets thrown into the params hash for you. And then we are going to render the edit template. OK, I do this every time. Edit is the same as the controller action, so we don't actually need this line here. That is implied. Only time you use that is when you break the convention, OK? We broke the convention in the create. Okay, We weren't rendering a template called create. OK, we're doing two different things. First, the successful one, we're actually sending a redirect back. In the second case, we were rendering the new template. In this case, we are going to render the, the, same, the same name template. So we need that template. So views, news posts, create a new file called edit.html.erb. All right, and let's, let's code this up. Let's see what it'll look like. OK, so here we'll say editing news post. Okay. And remember, we created an at news post in our controller which will be accessible here. And in this case, it was a entry that was extracted from the database and thrown to at news post. So we are going to use the form for helper again and pass in that news post. Again, form for requires that we specify a method that takes in a form builder. That's what that F is. Okay, and just for consistency, uh, I'm going to, so div class field breaks, okay. So I'm going to do a field div around all my fields. Okay. And very similar to before, so we're going to create a label for the title, and then we're going to create a text field for the title, and we're going to create a label for the body. And we're going to create a text area for the body as well. And then we'll create a submit button. OK. So again, all, the only thing we set up in the controller action was grabbing that news post out of the database, and now we're building a form around that database, or uh, building a form around that object. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at one of our news posts here. Okay. So just so we know about the ID, like we have the IDs here, right? 
So news post one, uh, news post two. If we just tack on slash edit at the end, that should bring us to the edit page, okay? So I'm getting an error here. No method uh, error in news post path. Uh, form four at news post do f. What are we looking at here? News post path. Oh, right. Okay. So I'm going to type something here uh, that you would normally never have to type, and you'll see why at the end of this lecture. Okay. Go with it on this one. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is this. Routes show. Okay, in your in your routes, in your show uh, method. Okay. Just add another argument to the destination here uh, as news post. That should take care of it. Okay, sorry, if you missed that, as news post, throw that in. Again, I'll explain why you won't need this in the future. And then there we go. We have the editing news post. Now, I want you guys, uh, if it's up and running, to bring up two tabs, because I want to show you guys something. Okay, so I want you to go to the new route. Okay, so news post slash new on one tab. And on the other tab, uh, you know, slash news post slash one of your news posts. Again, your IDs might not match mine, slash edit. Okay? These two uh, tabs here. Okay. Let's look at the templates for both of those. Uh, so Sublime allows you to split your ID into two columns, which would be very handy for this demonstration. Okay, if we look at this code, okay, um, it, it should look very, very similar, okay? In fact, it, it's almost identical. But besides the H1, obviously, we just have a different title on each page. One's editing, one's creating. Um, but other than that, the code is exactly the same. Okay. Now, remember what I said about Form 4. Form 4 is smart in the sense that it uses the values of at news post to put into your, into your form, right? So in one case, our at news post is a blank empty news post. And in another case, at news post is something that we've extracted from the database that actually has values. So that makes sense that you would get two different outputs, right? Like in one case, it's filled out. In the other case, it's not filled out, right? I mean, if we look at our controller, again, add news post for the new is just a brand new empty news post. But in, in edit, it's a news post that we grab from the database. OK, so that, that's not too surprising that if you pass in blank values versus non-blank values, they're going to look different, right? So that, that, that makes sense. So if we look at our two tabs, OK, one has blank values and one doesn't. Okay, that that that's that's pretty pretty all right. But it is pretty cool that it, it is dynamic to render that, right? But the more the the more cool, the cooler thing is when you start to inspect the code of this stuff, okay? When you look at the source of these two. So if you right click and you view page source of both of them. Okay. We can look at these two pieces of code. Actually, let me do this side by side as well. This is where I wish I had Windows. Um, OK. So um, our layout should be the same on both, because we're using the same layout. So all this JavaScript and CSS importing is the same. Um, if we look at the container stuff, that's the same. That's all part of the layout. H1, we said, is different on both, so that's okay. I mean, they're both H1s, but they have 
uh, you know, they have a different title in there, okay? But let's start to look down here. If we look at the fields, okay, the fields are almost identical except for value, which again makes sense, All right? The field names, like label four is news post title, the name is news post square brackets title, news post square brackets title, type text, so on and so forth. The only difference is the edit one on the left has a value, but those are all the same. The submit is the same, okay? Um, generally, there is a value here, so apparently it's even smart enough to know if you're creating or updating. But another thing that's really different is if you look at where the form is submitting to. Okay, again, when you create a form, you have to specify what URL that's submitting to. And if you look here on the edit, it's actually submitting to uh, slash news post slash two. It's actually submitting to the, the uh, that specific news post, okay? And it's submitting it with a, a patch verb, okay? So remember I said there's get and there's post, okay? There's also put, patch, and delete, okay? HTTP verbs. Now, not all browsers support these other verbs. So the way Ruby on Rails gets around it is just by setting, submitting that as part of the post data. Okay, so that's why there's this extra hidden field in there. Okay, so patch. Now, if we look on the right side of the new one, the action is already different. It's just submitting it to news posts, not a specific news post. And uh, the type is just a regular post. Okay, I don't think there actually is a method, an underscore method field in here. Yeah. Okay, because browsers, generally all browsers support posts, so they didn't use them there, okay? But again, we use the exact same code. So what's going on behind the scenes here with Rails? It's actually really simple. Very, very simple. If you follow Rails conventions, every resource, every regular resource has an ID, right? When you create Rails generate model, you have a table that has an ID in it, okay? That ID doesn't get assigned until you actually save something to the database. That's how Rails works. Okay, you set the title, you set the body, but there's no ID on that actual item until you say newspost.save, and then it assigns that ID and gets that ID, okay? All Rails is doing here is checking if the record you're passing to form four is a new record, then render that stuff on the right. Render the action to be slash news posts, be a post uh, method, and fill in the rest. If it's not a new record, then you must be updating a record. So we submit it to a different route, slash news post slash two, and uh, the method is patch. Okay? The way it checks if it's a new record or not is just by examining the ID. Is the ID blank or is the ID set? Okay? Which again kind of makes sense, right? If you think about it, if your record already has an ID, it must be an existing record and therefore you must be doing an update. If your record doesn't have an ID, it must be a brand new record, so you must be doing a create in that case. Okay? So that's how the same code spits out this stuff. Okay. What software principle am I violating here? Dry. This is not dry code. This is the exact same piece of code in two different files. Okay. We will get to how we can refactor that really nicely. Okay. But right now, let's just continue with the edit. Okay. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. Single. okay. So, uh, if we bring up the edit.html.erb. All right, this is presenting the edit page. Okay, now we can create links to this edit page because it's, it's ready there. So if you guys go back to your index, okay, we had a link to show details. Let's create another link to um, edit post. And that's going to be news posts slash news post ID slash edit. Again, you can decide to do it with the brackets or without the brackets. But remember, if you do it without the brackets, you need that space. And that's how Rails knows it's a method call. Okay, you have the method name and then space your arguments. Okay, again, this is the route that you just defined. The only thing is you're throwing in the actual news post ID inside it. Okay, and then you're just giving it the name edit post. Okay. 
So if we go back to our index page, I can close a lot of this stuff. Okay, hey, we'll go back to the index page and now see edit post links for each uh, news post, okay? So you click on edit post, you're editing this one. Click on edit post, you're editing that one, and so on and so forth. Okay, cool. Okay, now that we have the edit post form, we are gonna do something very similar to uh, create, okay? Create the route, update, and then send back to somewhere, okay? So let's create the route. So the update takes a patch method, okay? And it's going to go to news post ID, and that's going to go to the news post controller, update action. Okay, luckily our form already has that information in there. When you did a form for, that's exactly what I was just explaining, when you did a form for an existing resource, okay, it created a form, like if we examine this form, you see this form is posting to slash news post slash one, okay? And uh, hidden in here, there's a patch method, okay? I know it says post up here, but that's again, because not all browsers support patch. So Rails just says, send a post, but if you pass along a value called patch for method, we'll interpret that as a patch request, okay? So the form is taking care of us. It's already submitting to the right place. We just have to handle it now, okay? So we'll go to the news post controller. We need to create an update action. And it's gonna be very similar to this. Okay, very similar to that. We're gonna grab our, our news post in memory. We're gonna call an, a, something similar to save that's called update, passing in the parameters that came from the request, okay? And then if it's successful, we go back to the index, it's all good. If it's not successful, we represent them the form, okay? So at news post, we're gonna grab it from the database. Remember, that ID is coming from the URL, right? That's how we're able to get it. And then what we can do is we can call newspost.update, and this will actually accept uh, a hash of parameters. Now, we've already taken care of strong parameters in our create. Okay, we've already written this method down here, so we just reuse that, okay? Just a heads up, if you guys ever deal with Rails, um, uh, below four, so 3.2 and below. Um, update used to be called update attributes, okay? Uh, update attributes still exist in four, it's just, it's, uh, it's a deprecated uh, synonym for update, uh, at, sorry, for update. Uh, and then the other major difference, by the way, if you're dealing with Rails 3.2 uh, 3 and below, is you won't have this idea of strong parameters in the controller, okay? This code actually exists in the model as attribute accessible, all right? Those are the main two differences that I've, I've seen on a daily basis. Okay, cool. So if it's successful, if the update is successful, um, let's just send them back to the news posts. And if it's unsuccessful, let's just represent them that edit form. Okay, so hopefully this all works. See what happens here. Okay, so let's just start fresh at our index. So my site has launched, edit that post. My site has launched long ago. Update, okay, and then it updated. Now, theoretically, if I don't have a title and I submit it, yeah, it brings me back to the form. Cool. Okay, and you can see like, again, apps like Facebook, uh, Twitter for sure, are just like really fancy versions of this, right? You create a post, you set, uh, that post will 
be retweeted by other people. So you just send a link to those. You know, it has 144 characters in it. Like I bet you the data model of Twitter is pretty small. I mean, obviously they've gotten a lot bigger. They've done a lot more fancy stuff. Their profile page is really crazy and stuff like that, right? But what Twitter used to be, uh, I bet you the data model is actually pretty small. In fact, uh, the first Rails tutorial I, I read uh, walks you through building Twitter, basically. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so that's it. We got the update done. Last thing we need to do is take care of destroy. Okay. Um, so I will walk you through that. That basically takes in a delete keyword, or sorry, delete request. And that is going to be sent to post ID. And we are going to send that to. Last week, I talked a lot about conflicting routes. OK, in this case, again, as long as the verb is different, OK, you're, you're not conflicting route in that case. Okay? So delete, new supposed ID, new supposed destroy. There's no other delete uh, route in this entire file, so we're not going to have a, a conflict there. OK, so we're going to create a link that sends a delete request to this route for every single news post, OK? So we go back to our, our news post here, sorry, the index. And let's create destroy post. Again, the route is the same as the show. Sorry, I shouldn't say the route. The, the URL is the same as the show. OK, but if we left it like this, what kind of HTTP verb would this be? It would be a get, right? Because it's just a link. Links are just gets, OK? Um, so this is OK, because we wanted to get for edit. We wanted to get for show. We actually want to delete for this, OK? So this is where, uh, again, built-in browsers don't necessarily support delete. OK, so Rails has a way of going around that. And the way it does that is if you pass in, again, a method uh, argument into link2, OK, it's going to do some fancy stuff to make sure that's submitted as a delete request. It's actually really crazy what happens behind the scenes like with Rails. Like This is one of the biggest things I, I didn't know how it worked in a long time. And Rails JavaScript actually goes through all your code, and anytime it sees something like this, it it like creates a form around it and submits that form for you. Okay, so this is no longer just a regular link at that point. Okay, it's doing. Remember the form that we saw for the edit? It had a, a hidden method uh, parameter in there. Okay, Rails does the same thing with this basically. It it creates a form, adds this hidden field into it, and then submits that into uh, the Rails uh, router. OK? So we can leave it like that. That should work, actually. And again, if you're having trouble reading this code, just think of it like this. Again, link2 is a method, OK? And link2 takes in a string, another string for the path, and then a hash of options. Okay? Can't stress this enough. In Rails, not Rails, Ruby, if your last method, sorry, if your last argument for a method is a hash, you can omit the hash braces of it. Okay? And so that's why this ends up looking like this. Actually, one of the ways that uh, Ruby attacks method overloading. Okay? I didn't realize this until like a week ago, but I didn't realize Ruby doesn't have method overloading. All right. And if you guys don't know what method overloading is, this is why you come to class, because you hear that and be like, man, I should know what method overloading is, and go home and look it up. All right. All right, so that's good. Um, so let's refresh this. Now let's see if we can do some destructive work here. Destroy post. Unalicialized constant news post controller. Uh, oh, match priority rights. OK, this is the other case where you're going to have to, no, that should work. 
What am I missing here? Unless I was custom news plus controller. Oh, I have a typo in my routes. There's no such thing as a news post controller. There's a news posts controller. Let's try that again. Action destroyed cannot be found in the news plus controller. Do I have another typo? Oh, we didn't define a action. That makes sense. Read the error and you shall find a solution. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab that news post out of the database. Again, if we look at that route, right, ID is in the URL, so we can use that. Brand's ID. And then all we have to do is call destroy. Couple things I could do here. I could render a destroy template if I want. And I have to create a destroy template and say, like, you successfully destroyed the template or the object. You could do that. Uh, I could redirect somewhere. I could render one of the other ones if I wanted. I can do whatever I want, right? Uh, again, typical user experience, you just redirect them back to the index. Okay. I do find it a little bit weird sometimes, like when like the idea of grabbing an object to delete it. Like it seems like for me it seems more intuitive that that would be like a class method, like to delete something with a certain ID or something like that. Okay. But this is how it's conventionally done. OK, so that destroy should work now. Destroy post, it's gone. Destroy post, it's gone. OK. And just for extra points, it kind of sucks if someone destroys something by accident. So let's give them a little uh, confirmation message. OK. So uh, la, 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 la. You can pass in um, HTML5 data attributes into links. Okay, the way you do that is you pass in a data hash. Okay, so you pass in a hash to the data argument. Okay, remember this is all within a hash, a nested hash, right? And then you just pass in. So if it's like data dash something, that something becomes your key. Okay, and in this case. Now again, this is not something inherently built into HTML. It's not like if you pass a data. Wait, does data? Does anybody know that? Does data confirm that? I don't think any data has any inherent yeah. behavior, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is another example of Rails JavaScript at work. Okay, what happens is Rails looks at this and sees you have a data dash confirm on that element. So it's going to wrap that in JavaScript and present an Are you sure? And if you cancel, it's not going to do anything. And if it does, then it's going to go through with the, with the actual destroy, OK? In case you're curious, that is what this is. Require jQuery UJS. That is this Rails code that is handling all this stuff to make things like that possible, where you can just pass in a data confirm to a link, and it's going to create an are you sure dialog for you, OK? All right, so if we refresh this, you can see you destroy post. Are you sure now? OK. Are you sure? OK. That's the Rails RESTful resource. OK. This is, again, the foundation to like all well-designed Rails apps. OK. And it should be the foundation to all well-designed software, to be honest. OK, the idea that you structure your code around a model, OK, that's essentially an object or a class, OK, that you can interact with through CRUD actions, OK? Create, read, update, destroy, OK? Twitter, when you say post, you're creating a micropost, OK? When you go to update, you're updating that micropost. When you go delete, you're deleting that micropost. When you uh, retweet it, OK, you are probably, I don't know how they do retweets, but maybe they're creating a retweet object okay that links back to the original object okay things like that okay any questions about the rails restful resource that is like so much by the way okay of a rails uh 
programming, is understanding everything we just did there. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, we're probably not going to get to devise today. So what we're going to do instead is we are going to refactor. Okay, we're going to refactor a lot of this code. We already saw a dry uh, violation with our form. Okay, so we're going to introduce you to something called partials, which is which is very handy. Okay, and then I'm going to introduce you to some other things that can can really whittle down a lot of this stuff. Okay. All right. The first thing I'm going to do is fulfill a promise, which, as I said, I'm going to ask you to randomly type this and just accept it, and then after that. Uh, after that, I'll tell you why uh, I never really typed that. Okay, so everything we've done here is a Rails convention, right? Oh, sorry, not just this is not just Rails convention. This is HTTP REST conventions. Okay, outside of Rails, people use this as well as their uh, web service routes. Okay, uh, again, really well designed web service. Like I, the other day, I just got an email from a guy who's developing an Android app that's going to plug into a website I developed, right? And he's like, can you give me your, your web service API? And I basically just sent him these routes, and he's like, oh, perfect, good to go. Right? And I'm designing the, the iOS app for it. Right? And it's because, again, he's probably familiar with constantly plugging into these APIs like this. Okay? I mean, they might be different resources. They may not be news posts. They may be products. They might be, uh, you know, they might be users. They might be uh, whatever. Right? But a good API will have that kind of structure. Right? And then if you guys are developing these things, you're probably going to ask, what's your API like? What's your API like? And any good company generally has this kind of stuff. Okay? The super, super good companies probably have their own opinions about what's good and bad about this. But generally, I would say this is how you develop a really good web service API. Okay? And we'll see later on how this actually becomes an API. Okay? Because at this point, we're just returning web pages, right? When we get into Ajax and stuff like that, we'll see how we actually return data rather than just web pages. Okay? OK, so this is a Rails convention and an HTTP convention. OK, Rails says, let's follow the HTTP conventions. So why is Rails, you know, which has so many other shortcuts to do everything, why do they not have a shortcut to do this? OK, why don't they have a shortcut that takes care of a lot of this stuff, right? And turns out they do. Right? That's how you set up drama and delete. OK, so to actually shortcut these routes, OK, because these routes, you can, you can picture if you were ever to change this, OK? So let's say we weren't doing news posts. Let's say we were doing, um, again, like a products, a products resource, right? OK, we would basically copy and paste this, all right? And then for the products, all we'd change is the news post stuff, right? So then this would just become products, OK? Sublime makes that really easy, but again, it's not maintainable code, right? Like we're, this is all, all very similar, right? Just slash new goes to products new, slash products with a post goes to products create, and so on and so forth, okay? So Ruby on Rails has a shortcut for these routes because this is a very common pattern that we're going to be using, okay, throughout all of our Rails development, okay? So basically, you can replace this entire bit of code here with one line. And that's it. And you're done. So what we can do is we can comment all that out. Resources, news, post. Posts. Sorry. Plural. Really handy stuff. And you'll see, actually, that's exactly what I did in the last class. This is the code from the last class. I mean, th this is why I have this up as a reference. Because we so rarely manually code all this, that I had no idea what the actual regular routes were at that point. So I didn't like use this as a reference. Okay. But if you have resources news posts, that generates all those routes for you. Okay. I think it's a good idea to keep those comments in there so you guys know what's actually happening. And there's a lot you can do with resources news posts, by the way. You can restrict routes. Okay. So let, let's say, for example, that you only want the index of that. Okay. And you kind of reference it like this. So you only want the index and the new. Okay? Or you want everything except destroy. Stuff like that. Okay? It's, it's very powerful method picks in a lot of arguments. But for general programming of Rails resources, this is what you need. Okay? And that has all. Now the crazy thing is, 
Not only does it summarize all those for you, but it also does a whole whack of other things for you that we get for free. Okay. So this is why it's actually. I always, I always like. I was talking with the Ruby on Rails meetup about how to teach this because, because you get the routes across, but all the other stuff that resources does for you, um, you can't just get from hard coding like this. And that's why you need like these as news postings, okay? Because you start to get path helpers. Okay, what path helpers are? They're view helpers just like anything else, like link to and form four and stuff like that. Okay, but they're smart in the sense that they take in objects and they can generate the route for you. Okay, so let's let's see an example of that. So if we go to the news post index, okay, right here. Okay, slash news post slash this. This is the show of that, by the way. Okay, you can just pass in the object to link to, and it'll extract that route out of it. So here, I could have just done this. Okay, Rails has some fancy like two params methods and like it extracts the ID. Um, but when you throw that to the link to, then it creates the URL for that. Okay. It also creates helpers for every route actually that we talked about. Okay. So in this case, the edit route that actually has a view helper as well. Okay, it's called edit news post path, and that takes in a news post. And then this URL actually is the exact same as the show one, right? I mean, the thing that makes this different is the method delete we have under here, so we're not going to get rid of that. But the URL is the same, so we can just pass in news post for that as well. There's a couple of reasons this is advantageous. One, you are validating your URLs and your links, okay? Because these helpers are only created for valid routes. Like, I mean, it's kind of like catch 22. If these only exist because you define them, right? So if you were to type like before the way we had it, right? It's very easy to mistype something like that, right? But the thing is, you're going to find that out at an earlier stage by using this. Because if that path doesn't exist, this page won't load. The index page won't even load. So you'll find that even before you hit the destroy link, right? The other piece, though, that's really handy here is that the way you manipulate routes, you can avoid changing a lot of code here. OK, so like news post path. Let's say news post you later call news article or something like that, right? It'd be annoying to have to change all those strings everywhere, right? Well, Rails has ways that you can do that in the routes, and then it doesn't affect all your helpers everywhere. All right, so we'll save that and we'll refresh the page, see how it looks. Should be the exact same. Yep, looks good. Nothing's changed. So we have this handy little keyword resources news posts. Okay. Um, but what if you're using this and you don't really know all the routes that it spits out. How do you find out? You Google it. Yes, that's great. Okay, that's one way to do it. But you know what? This can get really crazy because if you think about it, you could have resource news posts, resource users, and you could have nested resources and all this stuff. Like the routing file can get very, very big and very crazy. And it can be very easy to lose sight of what actually you've created and what you have. Okay. So if you ever want a reference to see all the routes that are created from what you what you uh, la, la, what you code in here. You can go to your Rails uh, root, and if you type rake routes, this is going to read that file and spit out all your routes for you. Okay. So you can see everything we got. Okay. So get slash, okay, it's going to go to pages home. All right. Uh, get slash home is going to go to pages home. Uh, get news posts. Uh, and you'll see the brackets.format that comes into play a little later in the course. But that's going to be a news post index. So, and these are the full spectrum. Okay? And this is really handy because we do use a lot of shortcuts like resources. Okay? Okay, so let's quickly change a lot of this code that we have uh, to use these helpers. Um, actually, there shouldn't be that much. Uh, if you go to the show page, Okay, uh, this news post here, the index uh, helper looks like this, news post path. Okay, so you can change that there. 
Um, but the rest is pretty good. Edit is good. New is good. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it actually. Oh, uh, here new news post. We'll change that to new news post. Ah, uh, that's it. And you see, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you here. Prefix, okay. This word plus path is going to give you the the helpers that you talked about. Okay, so you have news post path, edit news post path, new news post path, and so on. And so on. Okay, so that's summary factoring to use the Rails uh, helpers, okay? And you'll find the more Rails coding you do, this is the way they go about things. They try to get you more and more away from regular HTML, okay? And, and the reason is, is that these ERB uh, view helpers have a lot more logic to them than basic HTML, okay? Not to say you can't do it in regular HTML, is that if you use the Rails, uh, the Rails view helpers to do this, okay, you have a higher chance of success because it's interacting with the server side and they're expecting certain parameters and so on and so forth. Okay. All right, let's end off with partials. Okay, so let's look at this here. We uh, have this edit form, and we have this. Uh, la, la, la. We have the edit form and we have the new form, and they look exactly the same except for the header. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are actually going to extract this code out, okay, into its own file called a partial. Okay, so the way you define a partial, uh, you can put it anywhere really, um, but if you're going to reference it in the same, uh, if you're going to reference it from the same folder, then it's easier to just put it in that folder. Okay, so I'm going to create a new file under news post folder, and all partials start with an underscore. I know you can't see that because my font is all messed up, but it's underscore, and you can call it whatever you want. Okay, in my case, I'm going to call it form.html.erb. Okay, all right. Now, what we should be able to do is just copy and paste this code, sorry, cut and paste this code into the form. Okay, and to slap that into uh, your original HTML, to slap a partial into it, you just call render, and then the name of the partial. Okay, without the file extension, without the underscore. Now, the way you should read this, okay, is that generally any variable that you define in a, in a partial is local to that partial with the exception of instance variables, OK? So the only variable we're really using here is an instance variable. So we don't actually have to pass anything to the partial. OK, but in a case where you have a local variable, or whatever, you'd have to pass that into the partial to use it. OK, so let's see if editing news post works now. Yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't have that many exclamation marks. Yeah, you should, but not yeah. All right, so that works, okay? And then we'll just do the same thing with the new.html.erb. So we'll get rid of all this and just call render new, oops. By the way, if you have partials in other folders, all you have to do is reference that folder that they're in, okay? So if this was in like users, you can do something like that. So new should still work. Okay. Partials are one of my favorite things, actually, in Ruby on Rails, uh, especially because I do a lot of one-pager scrolling sites. Um, if you browse my like portfolio, you'll see a lot of sites take this similar approach, uh, just one-pager sections. The, I split all these sections into partials so that they look like different pages, basically. They're just different files, right? So, okay. Any questions about RESTful resources or partials? Okay, we have three minutes. Uh, I'm going to show you something pretty cool. Um, that you, that is one of the coolest things that Rails ever introduced. 
Uh, it's a code generator. Remember, we use code generators for controllers. We use code generators for models, right? There is a generator called Scaffold. Some of you might have played with this, OK? So I'm going to generate a Scaffold. And Scaffold takes in the same uh, arguments as a model, OK? So you specify the name of the model and all of its fields, OK? So I'm going to create um, a Scaffold called you know products okay so remember the model is singular uh so let's say i'm going to be selling products on my website okay and you know the products will have a name again string is implied so you don't have to put it uh they'll have a description they'll have a price uh what else will they have uh, they'll have a discount okay Rails generate scaffold. And what generate scaffold does is everything we've done for the last four weeks, basically. OK, so what just happened there is this. First thing it did is it created a resources products route. Very cool. Saved us all the coding of that. Second thing it did is created a product model for us. Sweet. Saved us all the coding for that. It also created a migration for us. Sweet. Saved us all the coding for that. It also created a full controller with index, show, new, edit, create, update, destroy, strong parameters, and a whole bunch of other refactoring that's even smarter than us. It also created every single view that we just created, the form partial, the edit view, the H1 listing, uh, even some JSON returns, which we'll talk about later, the new and the, and the show, OK? In 10 seconds, basically, throughout our last four weeks of work, OK? Pretty, pretty cool stuff, Rails Scaffold. I am adamantly against courses that teach Scaffold before they teach how to build a RESTful resource. It, it introduces a lot of confusion, uh, and then people are trying to figure out what, how, what the hell, and then they end up using Scaffold without building everything that we just built. Okay? I purposely went that direction because it's easier to follow along what you're doing and what you're building, and now that you know what you're doing and what you're building, you can modify it however you want, and you can use Scaffold as your start. That being said, I am the farthest person uh, away from against Scaffolding. I use scaffolding all the time. Like it's really such a quick like I use scaffolding so much that like when I don't use scaffolding, all right, I always end up just coding everything up to the scaffold level. It's just like, uh, like I need this anyway. So I use scaffold, right? My apps are not super massive that the code, extra code there is gonna hurt anything. It's not like it runs extra stuff like that. People are very like, I don't know why people are so against scaffolding, because to me, once you know what it's doing, it is such a powerful tool to use. And it makes your code like follow a lot of really good conventions, OK? So feel free to use Scaffold. But again, like it's, it's crazy, right? Because everything we just coded, I mean, it might not be styled properly, but look, OK, whoops. There's the products page, right? Here's the new product. It created the form for us, description, price, discount, right? Uh, safety, gloves, yo, $10, 25% discount, create product. Okay, there's the show, there's the index, okay. So again, pretty crazy, right? There's the show, there's the edit, there's the show, everything we created, not styled the way we wanted it, but I mean, one line of code, I mean, it's pretty, pretty powerful stuff. So that's scaffolding. Cool. All right, that's it for today. Uh, next week, we will put some authorization around our app. We won't spend that much time on it, hopefully, uh, using something called Devise. Devise is a library, a third-party library that makes authorization and authentication pretty easy. Um, and then after that, we get into JavaScript and Ajax. Okay. Again, if there's something you want to learn in the next four weeks, please let me know. I'll try to squeeze it in if it's appropriate. Uh, if you want to learn like chemical valent bonds, that's probably not so appropriate for this. <laughs> but if you want to learn something else that's kind of Ruby on Rails uh, uh, related, I'll do that. OK, cool. Thanks again to CISA. Hopefully, uh, you guys are impressed with scaffolds. It's pretty cool. All right, yeah, that's it.